जय श्री राधे जय गुरुदेव On the instructions of Guru Dev and by his mercy, we carry on with our reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita Adalila, Chapter Four, in the translation from the Bengali by, and with the commentary by Shila Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada. We only just started last week our reading of this wonderful, wonderful chapter. And we continue today. We need a translation for the Japanese, if that can be organized, please. And last time I I spent some time giving some background for Chaitanya Charitamrita, and from the reactions I had, I understood that this was very uh, welcome. So I think again we'll go slowly, and clearly, and uh, look closely at the 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 situation, the background and situation of Chaitanya Charitamrita, and what it means for our practice as bhog, bhakti uh, bhakti yogas, bhakti yogis. So we remember from last time that Chaitanya Charitamrita is a biography. But it's a very special kind of biography. It's the most beautiful kind of biography. Yes, it's the biography of a person. That is, by that we mean, it's the biography of a <clears throat> of an ego consciousness that is born into a material body, lives a life into a in a material body, and then leaves this material body. So I could say we could say it's the history. It's a biography of a body. But of course, we understand that it's much, much more than this. We could say, if we were theologians, that it's the history of a soul. We could say that it's the history of a soul that took its took body took a uh, took a body in West Bengali in the 15th century and grew and lived a spiritual life and had spiritual realizations and preached. In a spiritual way, had uh, visions and and ecstatic experiences as a soul, and then this soul left that body. We could describe it this way, Chaitanya Charitamrita. But what's so wonderful about this book <clears throat> is that it is both things. It's both things at once. It's the story. It's the biography of a man, and it's the biography of a soul. So it's not theology, and it's not biography like you would write the biography of Napoleon. It's the story of how a soul, which that which is the soul of God, Krishna, appears and chooses to live in the body of a man, and how that life in a body spread an enormous um, message. To the world about Namasan Kirtan and and so on, but also how a soul, a divine soul in a body, experienced divinity directly. So we found out last time that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was not only a very nice teacher, a very good teacher, preacher, but he is、um, an example. An expression of how divine love looks in a material body, and this is important for us, because that is what we, as sadhakas, as mundane disciples of of、uh, Radha Mohan, are trying to live out our lives. We're trying to be expressions of a spiritual life while living in our material bodies, and that is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did. So this wonderful book is both is two things. It's the the story of an incarnation of Krishna of God, but it's also and more beautifully and more, what should I say, emotionally, it's the story of how God appears when he is tr- 
when he chooses to be a man and woman in material form. The book, just to remind you who have not studied it, the book has three parts. The Adilila, which we are reading today, is about the early pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And by early, we say usually up until the age of 24 when he took sannyas. And then he was a householder, just like you and me. He was a very devout and religious householder, but he was a householder and he had a wife and household and family and had dinner every night with his wife and so on. <laughs> so Adi means beginning. Adi Lila means beginning Lila. And then there's the Madhya Lila, which means the middle pastime. So in India, we have federal states and we, we have Uttar Pradesh, which is where Vrindavan is. And then we have Madhya Pradesh, which means the middle state. So Madhya means middle, the middle pastime. So from the point when he takes sannyas and then he starts teaching and preaching and traveling. And as we heard last time, then he deepens his understanding of his own he deepens his understanding that he is God, that he is Krishna. And I, like I said last time, try to imagine the emotional and spiritual experience of being born, growing up, and as you grow up, you realize that you are God. Something like this Jesus had, I'm sure. So this was what was happening before, I think, he left his householder life, but certainly intensely during the middle period. And then we talk about the third part, the Antia Lila, which means essentially the last part. And this is when he settles down in um, Jagannath Puri and, and has these extremely deep and ecstatic exchanges with his close um, associates. And then another, the, the third important element we talked about last time was the, the three pillars of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, the three pillars of our lineage, our, our tradition. And as uh, Gurudev has always said, these are starting with Bhagavad Gita, growing and, and, and fulfilling with Srimad Bhagavatam. And then finally, Chaitanya Charitamrita is the PhD of Vaishnavism. And then I think Gurudev has also said that, uh, that uh, books um, by uh, Ananta Das Babaji and others like Vilapa Kusmanjari are the postdoctoral, so the really top of the education. And so, by uh, Gurudev's mercy, of course, in our in our family, we go right into Vilapa Kusmanjari and Radha Rasa Sudhanidi. So we dive right into the very top level. And I know from because I know I speak with you and many of you, and that this is very challenging because it's very, under, very difficult to understand what this all means. And this is why Gurudev has instructed me, and with his mercy, we'll explore the foundation of this top, top level, which is the Adi Lila, chapter 4. Then the fourth point we had last time was about this confidential nature of, of the... Uh, of the fourth chapter. The, ch the name of the chapter is the confidential reasons for the Lord's appearance. And in this context, we understand that confidential means those reasons that are only known in the heart, only known in our soul, only known by our feelings, things that we can't put down on paper, we don't want to put down on paper things that are given to us without us understanding where they come from. So in this chapter four of the Adi Lila, we get the confidential, internal, and that means spiritual reasons for the appearance of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Why he came from the point of view of his heart. Why he, in his deepest desires, wanted to appear. This is always put in contrast, it's put in contrast in this book, with the external reasons. You could say the public reasons or the not secret reasons. So we say the external reasons are, or the, 
one reason is to teach us about Prema Bhakti, to teach us about Nam Sankirtan, that the, the chanting, the singing of the names of God together with others. Chaitanya pre preached for many years, but if we wanted to summarize his preaching, it would be exactly that. Sing the name of God with your heart, and God will be there. Nama Sankirtan, and sing it together with others, preferably. So that was the external reason. And then the that was chapter three, actually, of Adi Lila, which we have not studied. But the internal reasons, which we'll now go in detail in this the rest of the chapter, so I won't say too much now. The internal reason is R, and there are three. It's in order to have the experience of loving God, prema. How to experience prema. Krishna, who is admired by all his devotees, he receives love in endless amounts, day and night. So he has everything, and he knows everything, and he is everything, except for one thing, how it is to want to love God. So it's quite amazing in our tradition, it's absolutely amazing in our tradition, that we have a personality of Godhead who is all-powerful, all-beautiful, knows everything, is the ocean of all love, but is missing one thing, the one last thing in the universe that God is missing is the experience of loving God. Obviously, he's God. How can he know about loving God? And so in order to have this experience, his internal reason for appearing is that he should take the position of his favorite consort, Radharani, who loves him more than any other. Take her point of view, take her feelings, take her shape and form and relish that. See what that feels like. That's the internal, the spiritual reason, the um, personal or the, what should I say? The, uh, the spiritual reason for him appearing. Very beautiful story. And that, that, that desire of Krishna is what creates the entire Vraj Lila. So all these beautiful stories, the Leelas we read in Velapkus Manjari and Narada Rasa Sudaniti, these grow out of that desire. All of the Leelas, the Vraj Leelas, the Vrindavan Leelas, these are happening in the heart of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. These are the internal expressions of love. These are happening in the spiritual world. And the spiritual world, which is anchored, like the whole spiritual world, in the heart of God. But now God is not Krishna alone, but Radha Moham. God the lover and God the beloved. So this is the, this is the shape of our world. That the, the divine in our vision, in the vision of us in, in Bhakti Yoga and our, our Sampradaya is double. We understand that loving God is the greatest. God is great. The beloved God with full of all his beloved and beautiful qualities is great. But even greater is loving God. And that is the, um, that is what uh, Radharani personifies. So the, 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 the miracle about this appearance is that, that Chaitanya is uh, both things. He's an embodiment of Krishna who is preaching clearly in the first part of his life in what we called last time the Navadvip Lila. He's traveling, he's preaching, he's a devotee of Krishna. And there's a growing suspicion to, in his heart that he is Krishna. And then the second part of his life is the Vrindavan Lila, where he is drowned in the pastimes of Radha Mohan and the researching the experience of what it could mean to be both the lover of God 
Radha and the beloved of God, Mohan. And then finally, I said last time that the first part of his life, the the Navadvip Lila is associated with his close associates like Advaita Charya and Nityananda, of course, and Galadar and Shivasa. So the, the Tattva, the Pancha Tattva, the, the, the four close associates which appear with him and accompany him. But in the second part of his life, in the last part of his life, it's the Viraj associates, the six Goswamis, that become more important. They overlap, of course. They're both, they're all together everywhere. But it's the six Goswamis who document his thinking about the Vrindavan Lilas, his thinking about the Radha Mohan in the, in the forest of Raj. And so these become the central focus. We read last time um, uh, Mahaprabhu's introduction. And I want to give you, let's see, maybe three reminders of that, which were very important. And the first is that there are two sides to Chaitanya. Maybe I've said enough about it already now. There's the external reason, the, the preaching and the message of becoming one with the name of God. And then there's the internal reasons, the desire to relish Prema Bhakti. And the word I used last week to, to describe this, I don't think I'm the first, was ecstatic. And I think I talked a bit about what ecstatic means. Ecstatic means outside of itself. The experience that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has in his later life is ecstatic, that he somehow the emotional experience he's having in his heart is too big for his body. So it flows outside. We can see it outside his body, on his body, the way he moves and acts, and of course, the way he looks. He is outside of himself. Love is too big for this material body. And this is in the end of his life why he leaves his body, because the love he feels, the love between Radha and Mohan that is uh, playing out in his heart is too big for this body. So it flows out of him and his body becomes be, begins to uh, behave strangely and and he and he glows and shines and he dances and he's never sleeps and he's always relishing uh, his associates talking to him about the love affairs of the of the force of Viraj. So this word ecstatic is very important in this, in all of the the Chaitanya Charitamrita, but in particular here. The second point I wanted to share about is about the the unique um, character of love. This is where my meditation has been this week, trying to understand what love is and what divine love, prema, is and how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu must have experienced this. So before we go on with the verses, here here are four points about what love is and why it shapes the life of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and why it shapes our own lives as ordinary devotees. First, love is energy. We like to think of magnets, two pieces of metal which have an electrical charge and they pull together. There's a force, there's an energy that pulls them together. There's an attraction. Love is an attraction. Love is attraction, isn't it? And so there's an energy there. We see it in the material world. Things draw together. We know that atoms in the in ordinary material pull together. We can see the magnet. And this attraction of love, we don't know where it comes from. We don't know what causes it. It's completely mysterious, completely um, confidential. And what's more, I want to say both frightening and beautiful, is that we don't know where it pulls us. 
If we know what our emotions are taking us to, it's not love. If we feel in our heart a deep longing for a pizza, and we know the address of the pizza restaurant, and we go to the pizza restaurant and, uh, and our desire is fulfilled, this was not love. It was very nice and tasty. That's okay. But it was not love. Love is complete uncertainty. Love is complete risk. We are in love when we don't know why we feel what we feel, and we don't know where it's taking us, what it will lead us to, what sort of strange things we'll do, and what kind of life we'll lead if we follow it. So it's energy flowing through us that pulls us in a very beautiful way. Everyone here has experienced this. This pull comes right from the heart. Maybe it was a happy experience, maybe it was an unhappy experience, but we've all felt it. And yet it's going through us and we don't know where it's going. And we don't know what it is. If, we're, if we were made of copper wires, like electrical wires, then we could say, oh, that's electricity just flowing through to turn on the lights, to turn on the AC. But we're not that. If we were magnets that children play with, then we would understand why we're pulled to the other. But we're not that. We are something different. We're spiritual beings. And yet we feel this attraction. We feel this longing, this desire. And where is it, this attraction, this energy? Is it in our bodies? Well, yes. Is it in our nerves? Well, yes. Is it in our hearts? Well, yes. But what is it? Well, it's a mystery. So love is this energy that we cannot quite understand. Second idea about love. Um, we cannot ask for love. We cannot ask for love and get love. Love arrives. Love comes. Comes to us. Whether we want it or don't want it, it comes to us. Sometimes we find love when we don't want it. What a story. Sometimes we want love and we don't get it. Love is always there when we don't expect it. And again, I repeat, if we expect it, if we know how to get it, then when it will come, look, five o'clock, time for love, then it's not love. If we are not completely surprised by love, completely astonished by love, then it's just not love. It might be something nice, like a hot pizza. That's good. Pizzas are nice, but it's not love. So love is just like mercy, or maybe it is mercy. I don't know. Love is causeless, just like mercy. We say that mercy is causeless, right? Nobody can cause love. You cannot pay enough money to get love when you want it. You cannot have enough policemen to require somebody to give you love. You cannot have enough power. Nobody can cause it. Nobody can create it. It comes, love, it comes from a place where there's no power, where there's no money, where there's no policeman. <laughs> It comes like before the ego or before knowledge or before maybe even life. Love is there. Love comes before everything. And this is why our practice in bhakti puts love and loving at the highest level, because it comes before everything. Third point about love. Um, love doesn't want anything of us. Love doesn't ask anything. There's no price for it. There's nothing to pay. There's no debt. There's no requirement. There's no condition. It's pure, it's pure like this, love. It's pure feeling, love. So love doesn't want anything, but it does give one thing, or it does create one thing. And what's that? It creates more love. Think. Think about yourself, think about your heart, think about, meditate on your feelings about love. Any feeling of love that you've ever had has one consequence, more please. 
Please, let's have more of that. So love is what creates this want for more love. And this, it's this love is what creates what we call in bhakti greed. We say that we need greed in order to advance in, in our practice. Well, where does that greed come from? By fasting and praying and uh, being respectful and doing duties? No, greed comes from the love that's already there in us, but needs to be cultivated, dusted off, exposed. We all have a well of perfect love in us that needs to be uncovered. And so maybe the final point, the fourth point is that, um, which goes with the last point, that love, and now I'm thinking back at Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that love grows uncontrollably. So on the one hand, we cannot cause love. That's a little bit frustrating for us. But on the other hand, what's absolutely joyful for us is that we cannot stop love, that love grows. Love causes the need for more love, the desire for more love. It causes us to love more. And the purer it is, the more, the less it is detached from, sorry, the more it is detached from the material things we desire, the more it grows. And that is why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is ecstatic, why it's flowing out over his body. And why does love grow like that? Because the more we love, the more we have access to our svarup, to our spiritual self, to our spiritual identity. And that svarup is made 100% of love. So love causes us to purify our hearts. And when we purify our hearts, the consequence is clear. There's more flowing from the heart. Love brings us to ourselves, to our spiritual selves, our svarup, and that spiritual self is loving. Or to put it on the other side, love brings us closer to God because love is God. Okay, now I spent a lot of time on this, and I'm, if you were eager to read more verses, then I'm, I apologize. But this is how I think we need to understand Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's life in these terms, to try to understand the extraordinary life he lived and the extraordinary um, emotions that he felt. Um, last week we read then 16 verses. The verses in this book go quite quickly because they're shorter and simpler and also because up until now, Prabhupada has not been commenting very much. Today, he'll comment at more length. Um, the first verse of chapter four was about mercy and about how we need to have the mercy of Chaitanya in order to, to access our own emotions. The second and the third and the fourth verses were glorifying Chaitanya. And then the fifth and sixth verse started talking about the reasons, which I now have said probably enough about, the external reasons and the internal reasons. But maybe one last word there about his appearance. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was, as you might know, a very intelligent person, a scholar, an expert at singing, an expert at reading Sanskrit and Bengali verses and this, when he put, it was put together with the emotional experience he had, he was a very remarkable person indeed. Um, verses 7, 8, and 9, let's see, we talked about the last time that Krishna appeared on the earth. And then um, in the following verses, up to verse 16, we talked about the idea that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to give us the gift of Raga Bhakti. And that is why he appeared through his internal energy, through his heart energy, through his spiritual energy, because Raga Bhakti cannot be given through external energy. It cannot be given in the way that here is a nice idea, I'm preaching and you should accept it because you accept my words. 
and my intelligence. This was not enough. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was doing this. He was a preacher and he spoke with words and reasons and arguments and logics. But he understood that he had to do more to this than this. He had to speak from his internal energy, from his heart, from his feeling, from his soul. So that is where we ended the last week after 16 verses. And now in the 17th verse, what's very nice is that Krishna begins to speak. In these first 16 verses, it's the author of Chaitanya uh, Charitamita who's speaking, Krishna Das Kaviraj. He's narrating, he's telling what he's known. But in verse 17, um, Krishna begins to speak. Or at least according to Prabhupada, Krishna, be, uh, Krishna be, be, begins to think and we can hear his thoughts. But before we read the verse, let's remember that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna. So when Krishna is speaking in this verse, we're hearing the voice of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his material form, in his material existence. And uh, the theme of these next uh, verses, three or four verses, I think, is going to be a theme we had a lot in Bhagavad Gita. Namely, what can be reached through Vaidhi Bhakti, the Bhakti of respecting rules and regulations of worship, and what can be um, obtained through Raganuga Bhakti, the Bhakti of spontaneous love. Verse 17. Ashvarya Gyanetas Habe Jagat Mishrita Ashvarya Shitila Premanahi Mora Prita. And Prabhupada translates, he says, Lord Krishna is thinking, all the universe is filled with my conception of my majesty. But love, weakened by that sense of majesty, does not satisfy me. All the universe is filled with the conception of my majesty. Everybody knows about my majesty. I'm opulent, I'm beautiful, I'm all knowledge, I'm all love, I'm all everything. But, he says, love that is weakened by this majesty does not, majesty does not satisfy me. So if your love is somehow distracted by the fact that I'm so wonderful, then you cannot satisfy me. I want love that is love. I don't want you to look at all the high mountains I've created and all the knowledge I have and how beautiful my appearance is. I want you to love me. That's what will satisfy me. So don't let your love be weakened by looking at how wonderful I look, how wonderful I am. Love is weakened by majesty. Love is weakened by greatness, by power and domination and strength and authority. So this is the idea of Vaidhi Bhakti, that we do what we do in our religious practice because, we're, because someone told us to do that, someone external to us, someone else. Majesty is the power of the king. In fact, in Western languages, of course, where we have royalty, like in, like in Norway, for example, that I know, we say your majesty to the king. So majesty is the power of a king. It's the power of the institution, of the rationality, of the crown. But mostly it's the power of the ego, of the will that the king possesses. We know, of course, that bhakti is about the power of the heart. So, like I was saying a little bit before, Krishna has majesty. He's wonderful. He's beautiful. He has all power, all beauty, all love. But that's not what counts. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is speaking to us now in this verse, says, I'm everything. But unless you love me, I'm nothing. I'm not satisfied. 
So what's amazing, the king of everything, Krishna, God, is wants more. He has everything, but he wants more. And what's even more beautiful, who can give him more? A higher king? A higher God? No. We devotees who love purely with our hearts, we are the only ones who can help him. Or in this case, Radha, who is a devotee at the time. The only ones who can give Krishna what he needs are the devotees. He can't have what he needs by being godly. And this reasoning goes on now in the chapter, uh, verse 18. Amare Ishvara manne apanakkehina tara prema vasha ami naha i adina. Translation, if one regards me as the Supreme Lord and himself as a subordinate, I do not become subservient to his love, nor can it control me. If one regards me, if one sees me as Supreme Lord and himself or herself, of course, as subordinate, so if I look at God as the highest and I am lower, then, says Krishna, I do not become subservient to his love, nor can he control me. So then Krishna cannot be the servant of my love, and I cannot control him. And it's just the opposite that Krishna wants. He doesn't want us to look at him as the supreme God, and as ourselves as lower. He wants us to look at him as a relation, as a friend, even in the case of Radharani, as a conjugal lover. In that way, he can become the disciple of love. I can become subservient to love, he says. So what Chaitanya is telling us is that he wants to become a devotee. He wants to become a, a, a manjari, a servant of love. He wants to surrender. Krishna wants to surrender. It's amazing, actually. He wants to be controlled. He wants to be um, a servant of love, just like we all do. So in a way, we're all like Krishna. We all don't want to be God. We want to drown in the love for God. We want to surrender to the love for God. And like I said a moment ago, the one thing that God cannot do is to be the servant of God until Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who makes this possible. We want to realize that God is, is love and that God is, and, and that love is the greatest, but we can't do this unless we're in the position of the active, feeling, loving lover. We want to be in love. And our dear Krishna wants to be in love too, in love with God. We want to swim in love, so does Krishna. We want to live in love, so does Krishna. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu makes this possible. He wants to understand, just like we want to understand, that what reality is, is this experience of love. Everything else that is not pure experience of love of God is something less than pure reality. Verse 19. So we heard the word bhav uh, four times. Everybody heard this. So you know there's a lot of relishing and mellow and feelings there. So here Prabhupada translates. In whatever transcendental mellow my devotee worships me, I reciprocate with him. That is my natural behavior. Whatever mellow you're in, you are in, whatever bhav you have, pure or impure, strong or weak, large or small, uh, Krishna will give that back to you. Reciprocate means give back in the same way. So if you feel that love for God, God will feel that love for you. But then he says something special, that is my natural behavior. That is my constitutional position, we could say, like Prabhupada. The constitutional position of God is to love according to the love he receives. 
Now Prabhupada comments, the Lord, by his inherent nature, his interior nature, reveals himself before his devotees according to their inherent devotional service. So he shows himself to the devotee to the degree that the devotee shows her heart to him. The more we open our hearts, the more we will experience the divine. It's very simple and and very clear. So whatever the devotee gives in terms of devotion, from the heart, pure, honest, clear and simple, God gives back. Whatever love we feel, God gives back. Now let's stop a minute and think about what this means. The amount of love we get from God is not decided by God. It's decided by us, by the love we feel, by the love we are able to liberate from our hearts, the love we are able to give. That's, let's say that again and uh, listen carefully at how uh, revolutionary that is. It's not God who decides what love we have. God who created everything, who does everything, who decides everything, who controls everything. It is not God who decides what love we feel. We, we receive. He loves us following the love that we give to him. In a strange way, we could say that the source of love is not God. The source of love is the devotee. Or better, maybe it's better to say the source of love is devotion, our loving of God. And this also means to us that love is not, cannot be to be alone. Krishna is a lonely lover. Krishna has, is infinite love. He's the ocean of love. But he's alone. He's lonely. He wants not to have love. He wants to give love. That's what appears in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's what the nature of the divine is, according to our, our tradition now, Gaudiya Vaishnavism. The nature of the divine is to give love. It's not to be love. It's not to receive love. It's to give love. It's to let love flow. And like Krishna said in the last verse, the only way the love flows is when it's started by the devotee. When we open our hearts, then the love flows from, from God. The source of love is devotion. And the nature of God is to <coughs> return our love. So to worship God, if we want to talk in those terms, we want to talk about worshiping God, it means saying, hello, God, I see that you want to love too. Let me open my heart to you so that you can love. To worship God means to let God be love. And this is exactly what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu does in his life. Now, Prabhupada comments again, the Vrindavan pastimes demonstrated by, sorry, demonstrated that although generally people worship God with reverence, respect and fear, sorry, that's me saying, reverence means respect and fear. Prabhupada continues, the Lord is more pleased when a devotee thinks of him as his pet son, so his favorite son, personal friend, or most dear fiancé, and renders service unto him with such natural affection. Natural affection. So Krishna doesn't want to be the all-powerful God. He wants to be your son, or your friend, or maybe your lover, any way that will let you Give your love to him. And this, he says, is natural affection and natural in Vrindavan. It's not um, done by fear. It's not forced. It's not required. There's no, <laughs> there's no love policeman around. It comes naturally from your heart. Prabhupada continues, the Lord becomes a subordinate object of love. So the Lord becomes a servant of love in such transcendental relationships. So if we can purify our love for God, then 
uh, God will become, will surrender to that very same love. And this tells us something about the purity of love too. So Prabhupada says, now such pure love of Godhead is unadulterated. In other words, it's not polluted by any tinge of superfluous, extra, non-devotional desires. And this pure love is not mixed with any sort of fruitive action or empirical, philosophical speculation. So these are the three kinds of criticisms of, of devotional, or, or criticisms of practice that we hear often in the Bhagavad Gita too. Non-devotional, so with no love, or those that are fruitive, so, so looking to create a material product, or those that are just based on increasing knowledge. So the pure love of God is not polluted by any of these things, he says. And he goes on saying, it is pure and natural love of Godhead, spontaneously aroused in the absolute stage. You remember that this word spontaneous is everything in bhakti, bhakti in Raganuga Bhakti. Nothing can cause love, like I was saying earlier. It comes spontaneously, unexpectedly, in ways we cannot uh, cause ourselves and cannot uh, even understand. So this is how pure natural love comes, Prabhupada says. And then finally, um, this devotional service is executed in a favorable atmosphere freed from material affection. Verse 20. Ye yatamam prabatyante tam tattaiva bajamiaham mamavatmanuvartatam manushya parta sarvashaha. And Prabhupada translates In whatever way my devotees surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Prita, of Prita, Prita. In whatever way my devotees surrender unto me, unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Prita. Now, this is, I think it's actually a translation into Bengali of a Sanskrit verse in Bhagavad Gita in the fourth chapter as well. And Prabhupada says, says something like this in his commentary. In the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna affirms that formerly, so before, some 120 million years before the battle of Kurukshetra, he explained the mystic philosophy of the Gita to the sun god. The message was received, Prabhupada says, through the chain of disciplic su succession. But in course of time, the chain being broken somehow or other, Lord Krishna appeared again and taught Arjuna the truths of the Bhagavad Gita. At that time, the Lord spoke this verse, Bhagavad Gita 4.11, to his friend Arjuna. So this verse in Chaitanya Charitamita is the translation into Bengali of a verse from Bhagavad Gita. And the, the important point of it is that devotional service uh, follows through the parampara, through the disciplic succession. That's the only way. But in the last period, before Bhagavad Gita was spoken, this disciplic succession was broken. And so the passage of devotional feeling was broken. And therefore the purpose of the Bhagavad Gita, of speaking the Bhagavad Gita, was to re-establish the disciplic succession. And how does that happen? Krishna meets Arjuna on the battlefield and they become friends. And they become deeper friends. And they become <laughs> deeper friends and deeper and deeper. 
so that Arjuna becomes a deeply attached um, devotee of, of Krishna. So that in the end of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna can say to him, now surrender and you will find your path to, to paradise. Now, verses 21 and 22 are together and they are followed by a long commentary by, by our dear Prabhupada. Um, mora putra mora saka mora pranapati ei bhavye ye more kare shuda bhakti apanna ke bade mana amara samahina sehi bhav hai ami tahara adina translation from Prabhupad if one cherishes pure loving devotion to me thinking of me as his son his friend or his beloved regarding himself as great and considering me his equal or inferior i become subordinate subordinate to him so the verse is saying how Krishna becomes a devotee, and it's by us being perfect devotees. He says, if, I repeat, if one cherishes pure loving devotion to me, so if we love being a devotee, if we love loving, which of course all of us do if we're honest, if we're loyal to ourselves, if we understand ourselves, if we cherish loving devotion to God, thinking of me as a son, a friend, or beloved. So one of these, one of these three types of very close relations, one of family, or one of close friendship, or one of conjugal love, one of those three. And if we regard Krishna as great, sorry, we regard ourselves as great, and we regard Krishna as equal or maybe less, then he will become a devotee of us. And this is how Krishna becomes a devotee of Radha. She fulfills these conditions. She is a conjugal lover. She cherishes him and she considers him as God. So it's really, um, if you have any sort of strong conception of what God is, and all the Abrahamic conceptions of God are like this, that God is a king above kings, above kings, then this is a very remarkable thing to say. And again, I repeat, Krishna is speaking here. Krishna is saying this. Um, it has two parts, this verse. First, uh, it says, well, Krishna will become subordinate to anyone who practices bhakti. So Krishna will become a servant of a bhakta, a servant of a servant. So anyone who thinks of God, not as a God, but as a friend. So anyone who's in Sakya Bhav, the mood of a friend, or anyone who thinks of God as not God, but a son, anyone who's in um, Vatsali Bhav, the mood of a son or daughter, and thirdly, anyone who thinks of Krishna as a lover, in other words, someone who's in Madhuri above, the conjugal mood, and who thinks that Krishna is not a king, but someone equal, or maybe even inferior, to this person, Krishna is a servant, a devotee. So this is so important for us because these words come from Krishna in the through the mouth of Lord uh, Chaitanya. And it shows right in this verse what Gurudev has been teaching us now for some months, that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has three parts. He is Krishna. He's um, the one in the loving relation to Krishna, Radha. And he is the servant to Radha. A mantri. He's Krishna, he's Radha, and he's Mantri. This verse tells us. So we could sort of trans, uh, 
restate the verse in those terms and say, Krishna says now, if you are Radha, a devoted lover of me, in Madhuri above, if you are Radha, a devoted lover to me, Krishna, I will be your Manjari. I will be your servant. It's absolutely never before been this idea of the, the divine. If you are in the mood of Radha, the devoted lover, to me, Krishna, then I will be your Manjari. I will serve you in your service of me. And now Mahaprabhu is, uh, uh, sorry, Prabhupada, not Mahaprabhu. Prabhupada will comment, and he's going to talk about the different types of bhakti that are involved in this verse. He says, um, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, three kinds of devotional service are described, namely bhakti, ordinary devotional service, shuddha bhakti, pure devotional service, shuddha means pure, of course, and vida bhakti, mixed devotional service. So vida means Im impure. These are not directly in the verse. So pra 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 Prabhupada is taking us away from the verse a little bit here. But these are presented in detail in uh, um, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu by Rupa Goswami. So Prabhupada says now, when devotional service is executed with some material purpose involving fruitive activities, mental specul speculations, or mystic yoga, it is called mixed or adulterated devotional service. This is the word uh, vida. Papapad goes on. Besides bhakti yoga, the Bhagavad Gita also describes karma yoga, jnana yoga, and dhyana yoga. So karma, to remind you, karma yoga means uh, action in with with selfless goals trying to, to trying to unite with god through action with selfless goals yana yoga trying to unite with god by developing knowledge and wisdom and dhyana yoga trying to create um union with god through meditational processes meditational uh, practice. And now Prabhupada zeroes in a little bit more and he says, yoga means linking with the Supreme Lord, which is possible only through devotion. Only through devotion. So there are many forms of yoga. Here we just talked about three, but there are others as well. Yoga, all yoga means connecting with God. Yoga means union. Yog means union. And it's understood union with the divine. So all these practices, their goal is very beautiful, very good. How do we connect with God? This is what we all want. So there are different approaches to this. How do we do it? Um, the conclusion of this verse and the comment of Prabhupada is that bhakti is the best, <laughs> of course, it's the best, it's the strongest, but maybe we could also say it's the most um, revolutionary, the most radical. Why? Well, all the other forms of yoga start from what we call the marginal energy of Krishna, the subtle energy of Krishna. So they all, all these other kinds of yoga have a connection to material consciousness, to the body, to things about existence that will disappear with time. So, karma yoga is about doing things with our bodies that might have good effects. Jnana yoga is about doing things with our intelligence that might have good effects. Dhyana yoga is about doing things with our imagination that might have nice effects. So they're all what we call subtle energy or uh, marginal energy. They're all parts of our mind or our thinking or our memories or our imagination, which will disappear when we leave the body. 
Bhakti yoga, on the other hand, is fully spiritual energy. Practices in bhakti yoga um, express energy of the soul, energy of the heart, energy of the spirit. You might remember this kind of energy is called antaranga, shakti, energy, internal energy, spiritual energy. So bhakti yoga does not need the mind. Bhakti yoga does not need the willpower. Bhakti yoga needs no psychology, no uh, <laughs> decision making, no need for thinking at all. Thank God, sometimes we're so tired of thinking, aren't we? Bhakti needs only your heart, and your heart is never tired. The love in your heart is never empty. So this is very different from traditional yoga. And it's very, let's say, revolutionary because you cannot govern it, govern it. There's no words, there's no logic, there's no laws. So there's no police, there's no judge, there's no um, punishment. It's all straight from the heart. So while we say, and we said it a lot often in Bhagavad Gita, that these practices like... Um, Jnana Yoga and, and Karma Yoga and Dhyana Yoga, they can help us along our way. They can lead us to a place where we're ready to surrender. They are not in themselves bhakti. So Jnana Yoga, developing knowledge and wisdom, can take us to that place where we can surrender to our hearts. Karma Yoga too, can do that too. And so can Dhyana Yoga. But in the end, we need to surrender ourselves. So let's see, there's a comment now of Prabhupada. It'd be very nice to finish this commentary, but that's... Let's see, I'm sorry, I lost it. Prabhupada says, fruitive activities, so he means karma yoga, ending in devotional service, philosophical speculation, so here he means jnana yoga, ending in devotional service, and the practice of mysticism, here he means dhyana yoga, ending in devotional service. These are known respectively as karma yoga, jnana yoga, and dhyana yoga. Good. And he goes on. But such devotional service is adulterated, so it's polluted, by the three kinds of material acti activities. Each of these practices has a material element. So the... Karma yoga, we need to do things materially. Jnana yoga, we need to use our uh, marginal energy of our intelligence. And dhyana yoga, also we need to use the marginal energy of our imaginations and our memories. So they all have a material element. And he goes on, for these, for those grossly engaged in identifying the body as the self, pious activity or karma yoga is recommended. In other words, if you're in the position where you think you are, you're very clear that you are your, your body, then the best way to advance now in this situation is for you to do karma yoga. Do things with your body that contribute to um, devotion toward God. We're all where we are and we all need to use the resources and the conditions we are in. Now Prabhupada goes on. For those who identify the mind with the self, philosophical, spe philosophical speculation or, or jnana yoga is recommended. So if you're the type of person who likes to read books and think a lot and talk a lot and walk and, uh, and, uh, and uh, meditate and, and, and debate, then you should go on the jnana yoga path. It will lead you eventually to bhakti. No problem. But then, Prabhupada concludes, devotees standing on the spiritual platform have no need of such material conceptions of adulterated devotion. So if you're already very advanced in your spiritual life, if you're already very, um, uh, what do I want to say? If, you, if you're familiar with your soul, if you're familiar with your spiritual identity, your svarup, then there's no need for you to take these paths. 
you can you're ready to surrender directly to to bhakti adulterated devotional service says Prabhupada, does not directly aim for love of the supreme personality of godhead but that is what devotional pure devotional service does in fact just like love bhakti yoga does not aim at anything if you're trying to do something with your mind then you're still in one of these lower forms of devotion. If you're trying to do something with your body, you're in a lower form. Maybe on the way to the higher form, but still you're in the lower form. So bhakti is exactly that kind of devotion which comes um, automatically, spontaneously. And Prabhupada goes on now, and we'll finish soon. Therefore, Service performed strictly in conformity with the revealed scriptures, in other words, Vaidhi Bhakti, is better than such Vida Bhakti. Vida means, like I said, mixed or polluted, because it is free from all kinds of material contamination. It is done in Krishna consciousness solely to please the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So pure bhakti has one purpose, to give love to God. Vaidhi bhakti, the the bhakti of rules and regulations, has other purposes too. It wants to give love to God, but it wants to do it by making these rules and regulations the objects of the meditation. And we've said it many times, there's nothing wrong with vaidhi bhakti. Ananta Babaji says it's an important step in the path. It's very useful to learn learn the principles. It's very useful to know how to do puja. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. But the rules that are written down on paper to do puja, these must be filled with the love from your heart. And they must be replaced by the love in your heart. The principles, the rules must become love. In fact, that's what I would call realization. Spiritual progress does not mean throwing away Vaidhi Bhakti. All the beautiful time you spent, or I have spent, just like you, singing Arti because I, reading the text because I don't remember the words. So I'm singing what the words the paper tells me and not what my heart tells me. There's nothing wrong with this. It's not something that's evil because I'm, it's not coming from my heart. It's coming from the paper. No. The process is that this experience of the words of the art team become part of my heart. They become spiritualized. So I've said this kind of thing before. Uh, realization, enlightenment does not mean leaving this physical place and going to another place. Maybe in the clouds or maybe on a mountaintop or something. No. Realization happens right here where we are. Realization does not mean changing our world. It means realizing that this world is is spiritual. It means changing our awareness of this place. It means seeing this place with our with our souls, with spiritual eyes. It means understanding that what we have is already a hidden spirituality one that we've been hiding from ourselves. Realization is a way of seeing. It's not changing the place. When Gurudev goes into Samadhi, he doesn't go, he doesn't leave anywhere. He stays in his chair. But his consciousness goes somewhere else. His consciousness changes. Siddha Dei, the perfected body, does not mean another body, another material body anyway. It's a form that our soul takes when our consciousness is clear. It happens in our soul, the change. It doesn't happen in our body, the change. It doesn't happen in the material world, this change. It happens in our soul. Our soul changes gears. Our soul changes frequency like on the television or the radio. That's what realization is. And this can happen also when we're reading the text from the RT because we can't remember it. When it becomes a soul text, then we've achieved achieved realization. 
Uh, I'm seeing the time, and I but I really want to finish the um, the commentary and say a few things about it. Now, Prabhupada will describe this bhakti consciousness. He says, those who are spontaneously devoted to the Lord and have no aims for material gain are called attracted devotees. They are spontaneously attracted to the service of the Lord and they follow in the footsteps of self-realized souls. So spontaneous means I feel it, but I don't know why. It just came. I don't know why it came. It just started. It means that there's no cause, there's no um, condition, it cannot be controlled. I don't know where I will feel it, I don't know when I will feel it. Maybe I'm washing my hair in the bath and I feel it, or maybe I'm walking my dog and I feel it. I cannot say. We cannot know. It's unplanned, it is uncalculated, it's unexpected, it's uninvited. And you know, what's more important, what is the it we're talking about? It, it comes. What is it that comes when we feel spontaneous devotion? It's prem. It is prem. Prem is the actor. Our minds stop acting and prem starts acting. Prem is the only thing that acts. Pure mercy, again, we cannot cause it and we cannot <laughs> stop it. We cannot, if we don't like the love of God, we cannot do anything. There's no nothing to do. We can't destroy it. And we talked last time about fragility, or maybe it was in morning class. We talked about how fragile Prem is. Prem is, the love for God is so immensely powerful and immensely fragile. Why is it fragile, the love of God? Because the moment we dirty it with just one material attachment, it disappears altogether. The love for God is so beautifully pure that if we disturb it, if we touch it, try to change it, try to use our egos on it, it's gone and we have to start again. So Prema Bhakti in Manjari Bhav is the process of um, nurturing Prema like a small plant that we planted in the ground, letting it grow. And, by, and anyone who's a gardener knows that to make a plant grow, you can't just put a ton of uh, compost on it and push it very hard and, and put uh, liters of water on it. And all you have to be very, very, very gentle. And if you're very gentle, then it will grow. And if you're gentle again, then it will grow and grow and become stronger. And soon it will be a tree that you could never even climb. And all of this has to come through through mercy, by giving, by giving, without asking anything. Okay, now we finish this commentary of the verse. Prabhupada now describes, um, let's see, devotional bhakti and explains how it's greater than vaidhi bhakti. We know this story, but let's listen to Prabhupada now. He says, their pure devotion, by, by that he means the, the Shuddha Bhakti, the perfected Bhaktis, manifested from pure love of Godhead, surpasses the regulative principles of the authoritative scriptures. So at the moment when we achieve more pure Bhakti, we move beyond this Vaidhi, regulative rules and regulations. Prabhupada continues, sometimes loving ecstasy transcends regulative principles. Such ecstasy, however, is completely on the spiritual platform and cannot be imitated. The regulative principles help ordinary devotees to rise to the stage of perfect love of Godhead. Once again, we follow the rules of the puja. We sing the songs according to the paper in front of our nose. And this lifts us. And then at some stage, we leave these things behind us, and it's our heart that makes us fly. Our heart, our souls, which make us move on. It's very much like the image of, a, of climbing a, a ladder or a stairway. We climb and climb towards purification, and at one stage, we kick with the foot, 
and the ladder falls away and we keep climbing without it. So we have to, we need the ladder, but at some stage we need to let the ladder fall away. Prabhupada says, pure love for Krishna is the perfection of pure devotion and pure devotion, pure devotional service is identical with spontaneous devotional service. Pure love is pure devotion, is pure service and is spontaneous. Prabhupada, flawless execution, so flawless means without any errors, without any mistake, perfect execution of regulative principles is exhibited in the Vaikuntha planets. So the Vaikuntha, this is where Vishnu lives, right? The, this is where the majesty and the power and the opulence lives. So that way, that's what we can get by just following the rules and regulations. And finally, Prabhupada says, by um, strictly executing these principles, one can be elevated to the Vaikuntha planets. But spontaneous, pure loving service is found in Krishna Loka alone, is found in Vrindavan alone. So the principles take us to Vaikuntha, to Vishnu. Spontaneous love takes us to Radha Mohan, where there's softness and sweetness and depth and pure devotion.